Okay, folks, uh, good morning and welcome to uh, this webinar, where, uh, which is organized by Signicat, but we have some really prominent guests joining us. And um, yeah, we got an interesting topic here. It's about um, the ADAS regulation, or is more specifically about European digital identity wallet that is introduced, going to be introduced in all EU member states. And yeah, this is a new electronic identification means. It's a bit more than that, but it's a new electronic identification means. And of course, it's not the only electronic identification means around. We've got uh, several existing already, and in many member states, even deployed broadly. And uh, what happens when you add this wallet to um, on top of that? So um, I'm Jon Nevenes. I'm tribe lead, as we call it in Signicat, for signing and trust services in our company, trying to promote those products in the European market. Uh, I'm going to be one of the panelists, and uh, another one is my dear colleague, Jan de Juttila. Please, Jan, over to you for a short introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Jan. Good morning to everybody. My name is Jan de Juttila. I'm heading the, the uh, Partners and Business Alliances within Signicat, and I happen to have some hands-on background on this topic. Uh, I, I, back in the days, I was launching and leading a, an EID, electronic identity provider, uh, the Finnish mobile ID. Also, I was uh, very much involved in creating the first EIDAS 1.0 cross-border transaction pilot. So very, very uh, interested in this topic and happy to discuss this with, with all the others today. Yes, so then we have... Uh... Kalev, which is leading one of the most successful, I would say, EID providers, existing EID providers in Europe. Please, Kalev, over to you. Yeah, it's absolute pleasure to be here with you guys uh, and discussing this new regulation. Uh, been in the business uh, of EID now for 25 something years, and uh, yeah, this promises to be an interesting era for us. Thanks. Last not least, we have uh, John Sharma. We, we, you're going to be our moderator for the panel discussion, but we're pretty clear that it's a moderator with his own opinions. So yeah. I'm sure you've also been intervening in the discussions with your opinions, John. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm John Sharma. I'm director of the Global Trust Foundation, which is uh, not-for-profit uh, organization uh, whose one of its main uh, areas and topics of uh, interest and activity is in the digital wallet uh, and you will know the many conferences and things that we put on. Uh, my background is um, EIDAS from the very beginning in fact and from before that uh, I've been in the domain, uh, like many of the people here from uh, um, 2001, 2002 onwards, uh, and find it uh, a very exciting time. So um, let's, I think we should really start over and I'll uh, just like to say a couple of things. First off, that we're really discussing the digital identity wallet today in, in, in EIDAS. We're not really touching upon the trust services and all the other related issues in EIDAS too. Uh, so we'll try and focus down on the identity wallet. In my opinion, that's actually the most exciting uh, part of the legislation as it happens, the one that impacts citizens most. Um, and we're going to look at uh, some of the reasons why the identity wallet can be a great success, transformational, or it can be a partial success or, God forbid, a failure. But um, please feel free to put your questions, submit your questions on the system, and we'll try and answer them uh, at the end of this blog. At the, sorry, at the end of this webinar. So we'll start off... Uh, launch straight into it and uh, the European identity wallet really from my point of view 
has the potential of making real societal change. It's um, in quite um, an advanced stage of piloting at the moment. There's more work to go and trying to understand as the specifications develop. Um, interestingly, it's working in, it will be working in parallel with the single uh, digital gateway from the EU and uh, also within the, um, also in parallel to the once only principle, which is, uh, um, we'll discuss a little bit later about, but that's all part of the um, uh, single um, market. So what we're going to do is we'll uh, uh, talk also about organizational wallets, because organizational wallets, as far as I'm concerned, is really are really exciting you've got lots of small businesses uh lots of organizations that need to be able to work with others and from that point of view i think organizational wallets will be the savior of um yeah of uh the digital uh identity wallet in fact it'll be the main driver uh, and we said before and you saw the slide beforehand the most important thing is why is it going to be a success if it will be? And that's because it does make uh, life easier, faster, safer, and more efficient. And those are the goals. And if we can achieve that, then it will uh, work. <clears throat> It'll be a great success. Um, also, digital wallets are great democratizer because... Uh, and it's a real dem democratization of uh, credentials, and it means that you can use credentials, you can pick and choose bits of the credential that you want to show, um, you can selectively disclose parts of credentials, and when you're disclosing the credentials, there's no reference back to uh, the issuer uh, at that point. And that's important because it means that the uh, you have a measure of privacy that you wouldn't have with a normal online credential uh, that is um, tested and checked and uh, issued by the um, um, and, and provided by the issuer when it's uh, when you want to use it. Also, there's great opportunity. The way the um, coding is going to be written, or being written, is that it, there's a great opportunity for cross-border interoperability. All wallets should be interoperable to an extent. And that is great. And that means that's a real move forward for us. Um, there's one other thing. It's by, by bringing uh, digital uh, identity wallets, it starts bringing the focus and the nexus of uh, the domain back into Europe uh, and uh, away from um, some of the larger US organizations that have dominated everything that we're doing for so long now. So uh, it does provide a little bit more independence, which is great. Um, from a societal point of view, um, it's going to be uh, that everything is being done to make um, credentials um, more available. The, um, the regulation is written in a way that it's uh, that governments each member state does have to uh, provide uh, at least one EID um, uh, digital identity uh, wallet uh, offer to the citizens, and that's by regulation. It doesn't have to be taken up, but it has to be made available. Um, not necessarily this, uh, not necessarily one only, but it's each member state can be. Um, uh, can provide, um, a, should provide a wallet. And it's all about the principle of user control. So legislatively, it's quite um, exciting. And I think it'll be, um, could be the potential for a game changer in society. So one of the questions we'd like to ask is, um, where is the difference between um the digital identity wallet and the existing eids that we have 
at the moment and uh, I'd like to put that question across to uh, the speakers and how um, these will um, how the difference how the interplay is uh, I touched upon oops before the uh, once only uh, process but uh, I'll start off with Jon Olness. Um, Jon? Yeah, well, I, I think I got two two topics to highlight there. One is that um, uh, the the decision made by the European Parliament now and soon to be confirmed by the Council is that every member state in the EU must offer an EID to citizens. And this is not the case today in many in many countries. So it will be a ubiquitous. It's it's also your your right, right, to get a digital way of uh, proving your identity, and not only proving your identity, but also proving further characteristics, attributes about you. And that right is quite fundamental, and I think it's a very good principle that it has been established. The other thing I would highlight is um, the. Uh, call it the wallet way of thinking. Um, there is a uh, something called self-sovereign identity, which means the user is completely in control and controls everything and uh, no one can meddle with it. And the wallet is not self-sovereign identity, but you could say it's self-sovereign identity inspired in a way. It means that focus on the flexibility of providing more information and doing it under user control in a secure way. That's different from most the EIDs we see in the market today. And um, we'll discuss later uh, what happens to the EU wallet. Will it be a success? Will it be a failure? Will it be something in between? But what we see already as an effect is that uh, other EID providers are also thinking in the same direction. So we see the wallet way of thinking taking on uh, with the EU wallet, but also with other solutions. Those are the two effects I think are. Thanks. Uh, Kalev, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that to continue, well, first of all, I would like to argue with most of the statements done already, but. Uh, uh, to continue from the Jan statement about the uh, about the uh, issuance to all the citizens of uh, EU, some or having the ability to get one uh, EID from somewhere, it also that it now extends through the attribute at the station. This kind of understanding what the identity claim needs to come with. It's not only your name, your your birth date maybe, but it also includes all the credentials you have gained throughout your life to perform actions in, in, in electronic world now. And, and this kind of uh, common way of explaining what type of uh, credentials you can present together with your identity or even without your identity, proving only your uh, age, for example, or, or your uh, doctor's degree from the university in some context. And I think will broaden the spectrum where this type of identities can be used to the full extent, meaning that the process does not require anymore some additional way of activities uh, that has been the process so far that you present your identity from one uh, one side of the process and then you go and fetch your data from some background uh, environments. Uh, to, or, or you present them even in paper form later on, which is very annoying. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that in itself is a good example of how you can uh, improve the workflow in any process by the fact that you've got the paperwork already with you rather than having to go away and collect it and do whatever it is if it's a paper document. Jana, any comments Cause, uh, um, of interest? Yeah, I think one yeah. comment regarding and going a bit deeper into the into the notion of identity. I think EI 2.0 has achieved one major thing already, which is that EU citizens identity comes from the member state. And that sort of that is the anchor identity. And that can be sort of uh, uh, issued through the EU wallet. 
The question is, will it be used on a daily basis through the EU wallet or something else? But the anchor identity as such flows from the state through the EU wallet into other types of wallets. Yeah, I think that's a very good point that it's uh, that anchor that anchoring provides the Europe a European identity whilst maintaining uh, individuality of each member state, which is a very nice uh, point. I think at this point, maybe uh, it might be interesting to have a quick audience poll, I think. So what we'd like to do is, could we have uh, a poll now? And I'd like to ask the question, which is the best, uh, uh, which best describes the familiarity of the uh, uh, I, digital identity wallet, the EU DI wallet. Um, there are three points: uh, expert or intermediate or beginning, or you don't have any knowledge of it. Uh, so we've got two minutes. If you could be kind enough to uh, vote on that, you should be able to vote uh, now, and uh, it will take a little bit of time, uh, about a minute or so, to go through. In the meantime, while we're talking, uh, I think it's. Uh, uh, really, we've got a great opportunity now, just in general, the, to move society forward. And um, we're very privileged to be in this situation now. And I think it's one of the um, most notable regulations uh, in our domain that's come out that I can think of. In fact, it's building on, it's the second half of EIDAS. <laughs> The bit that really should could have been done originally had the technology been there. Right. Okay. We have um, some results. I think I don't know if they're changing, but uh, it does look like we have uh, uh, the majority of people are intermediates, which is what we would expect, and beginners, which is good. So um, uh, that's fine and. That's very good. So most people know a little bit about it uh, and they know the basics, but uh, need to know more. And that's uh, very important. Beginners who are just getting started in a similar situation. And that could be because it's quite a complex uh, process and it's still very open, I guess, some of the details, which is what um, this poll shows. Thank you very much for that poll. Um, I'd like to go forward uh, with the effect of EIDAS2 uh, on the identity um, landscape in general. And uh, it's quite interesting on the effect tool. Can I ask the speakers, let's start uh, with, we'll go, we'll start with uh, Kaleb this time. What's really, do we see the pathway and the interaction between the EID itself that was alluded by uh, uh, Jan uh with the wallet itself. Where's the um, reactions? Is it going to be the only uh, trust anchor as we talked about, or will it be uh, a bit more, um, more open than that? Well, it's very hard to, of course, say what it will be, but uh, in some sense, the setup was uh, ready to really just have one line in the regulation to state that, yeah, we need a high level identity scheme in every member state. Uh, and we would have been probably very well off uh, in most of the countries. Uh, we now have created the obligation also to issue a wallet, which is a uh, not voluntary uh, thing in, in every member state. It has a very tough timeline. So the interplay there will be that the focus I think that uh, uh, of the public sector uh, to get things out uh, from the factory, uh, the things that are called wallets, it will be such that there is no time for the next three to four years to deal with almost anything other than this wallet. So I think that we will have in hindsight a lot of learnings that we say that, yeah, it should have actually been done in a totally different way because there is no time to experiment on anything. We, The first idea we have that seems to work, that is something that we need to roll out in all the member states, it seems. So this old thing will definitely have less uh, less attention now. 
And the other thing is that that's still, I, I think the big thing is that neither the wallet or the EID schemes are, are, are not still trust services. So meaning that they are kind of regulated by member states within member states in a very kind of a sort of small uh, scale uh, and not pan European way as the trust services are. So it, it still is like a bit of struggle between the EID schemes and, and the new wallet uh that is probably promised by the new regulation but yeah from the other end of course there might be that you have the wallet and then you have the new uh the old eid uh, still available you onboard with the old eid uh, to the new wallet and then you forget your old eid this is also one dream that people have yeah it's uh from a time wise it's very interesting because there was a uh, quite a uh, delay between uh, member states, all the member states deploying wallets. There was a bit of a spread, uh, uh, EIDs, there was a bit of a spread in time. Uh, and hopefully this will compress it all a bit more and get things moving. But the concept of it being a distraction is uh, really um, interesting, a distraction from other digital affairs. I hope it's not the case. But it may be a lot consuming in this particular part of the identity space. So, um, that's. Are there any other comments on this? Because otherwise, I'd like to think a little bit about the role of um, the EIDs going forward. And although it's a societal changer, what do you think maybe failure looks like? If you know, it follows on from what we were saying, Kalev, what you said, Kalev. Uh, what do you think that failure looks like if it doesn't, what well, it does isn't taken up? People, uh, companies, and uh, all good people don't want to use it. Could I jump on that one? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, first thing I did um, when EDAS two first draft was out there was I went back and I wrote a blog entry called Four Reasons Why the European Digital Identity Wallet would, could fail. And it's definitely not that we want it to fail, but it seems like in, in many other webinars and contexts and whatnot, you uh, you get the impression that this is uh, a sure success. Uh, what we know is it's definitely going to happen because it's been it's now in the law. And there's a lot of money being spent on it, and uh, the outcomes could be different. Um, it could be that in a few years, everyone has a wallet in every European member state, and uh, we use it on a daily basis, and that solves a lot uh, regarding the digitalization of society. It could be that people don't want it, they don't see the use cases, and uh, yeah, it's there, but no one uses it. We use as other EIDs, and hopefully at least we do use something. And it could be in between, right? It's a success in some member states. They get a deployment and uh, the use case is going. Um, and in other member states, it's not a success and uh, no one uses it. It's a part success. I think... Uh, uh, failure is when no one uses it anywhere or only in a few countries. If it's a partial success, it solves um, the other problems in some countries, then it's good. And what, what is interesting to me, and I don't have the answer to that one, is uh, will it more likely be a success in the countries where we already have EIDs and we are used to them, or is it more likely to be a success in the countries that don't have anything today. Uh, I don't know if any one of you elders have an opinion on that one. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah I, I, I think that the risk of failure is tied to time. Uh, too little, too late. This identity space is developing extremely rapidly. Highly interesting sort of private sector identity payment wallets coming to the market and they will reach cross-border scale quite rapidly some of them. Uh, if the EU identity wallet comes to the market very slowly and with very limited functionality, then yeah, I think it will end up like Jon described that, that nobody uses it for much anything. And there are more user-friendly alternatives available. So I, I think that's what the fader will look like because it will come to the market because it's law, it's, there's too much sort of interest invested into it. 
And the positive impact, I think, is that each and every EU member state needs to solve the sort of digital identity issue somehow, which is surprising that they still haven't. Uh, quite amazing to me, given that we have such good examples from Baltics, Nordics and other Benelux countries and others, how, how much they sort of both uh, develop the digital society forward, but also bring security for the users of the of the existing electronic identities. Yeah, it's also a matter to do with how much each member state spends on publicizing them and bring increasing the awareness. The EU appears to have uh, given that responsibility over to each member state uh, because they don't have much of a central budget for this. But each member but state should uh, be pushing. Sorry, Caleb. I mean, I mean that this uh, that that they don't have like a control and, and, and budget, but uh, they actually do now. Like, this is the uh, terrible thing here. Like, you you see that we are spending probably tens of millions commission money, then hundreds of millions probably of uh, member states money on the wallet. And coming back to the question, what the failure looks like. It is basically that we have spent all that money for nothing. So those countries which don't have the EID still don't have it. And the countries where the EID already did exist, the, the functionalities that we are talking about within the wallet did exist. And, uh, and we basically are in the same place after like spending trillions of uh, money in the European Union, gaining economic wise, nothing uh, in between. So. This is probably the failure. Uh, so the fact that there is a wallet in those countries where the EIDs uh, and the ecosystems already exist to make it any better. And then the countries which don't have it, they still may at the end of this whole process have the chance to get one, but it doesn't work anywhere. So this would be, in my view, a clear failure for the whole setup. And, and oh, there is some kind of a central money, I would say. That was kind of a thing that I wanted to catch on. You, uh, that, that there is now a clear central money, central control over it, and, and the control goes more and more central uh, throughout the regulations coming from the Brussels at the moment, the, the EIDAS being one of those. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Uh, um, I, I was thinking the risks uh, there, there's something just to bear following that on. What are the risks involved of if it fails? I know that there's still, uh, I don't want to harp on failure too much, but uh, there has to be a pla the plan B is, uh, could, we, could it move us backwards if it fails, if people aren't interested? Or would we just carry on and uh, the money just be thrown away, I guess, or... Um, and then the the process carry on carries on as it is. Uh, I'd be a bit worried if it that was uh, if everything got thrown away. But I'm sure we're learning a lot, and there'll be a lot of developments even without uh, even without the wallet being success. As Jon uh, Luna said, that it's uh, much to do is we've learned a lot already about the relationships and things, and that learning is also very good. And will stand us good stead in the future. So um, we're um, coming to a point where I'd like to maybe um, talk uh, a little bit more about the usage of the wallet. Because I think the wallet itself, as we said, is really it's the value is what can it be used for? People don't use technology because it looks like great technology. Because we're the only ones. Uh, um, most citizens don't understand the technology. They want to see the results and the outcomes. And that I think is most important, which is where we started off here with regards to faster, cheaper, um, more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the question is that um, would we all use the wallets uh, in five, let's say in five years' time, would we want to be using the wallets? Um, how would what would we see uh, the wallets uh, being really um, something that we could see would be really a compelling reason to? 
But before that, let's have a, a quick view of uh, another quick view from our audience, if we could. Um, in, let's pass question. Five years time, do you envisage yourself using the EID wallet? Uh, if it was available, would you go out and use it? Uh, interestingly, I remember back into the early days before EIDAS even, and there was uh, discussions about how many interactions citizens have with the government. Uh, it was a per annum, it was a stupidly low number. I think we were talking about one or two or five interactions per year. This is the idea of moving it away from that into the uh, organizational wallet should dramatically change and make that first uh, statistic irrelevant. So, um, John, if I want to break in on that one, because yeah. we got statistics from the, um, the login portal, the authentication portal for the Norwegian yeah. government, for example, which is a common place where you authenticate to log into public services. It shows that people on average log in like 50 to 60 times per year, uh, each week. Some are frequent users, some less frequent. No way. If no it's way. available, I think it's, if it's available, you use it. Yeah. If government is not digitally available, of course, you interact with them a few, a couple of, a few numbers each year. All right. Yeah. Norway was always exceptional to start off with. It was, I, I seem to recall. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you're right. But once it starts going, but in the original time, I remember the question was, especially with regards to, well, how often is this going to be used? So uh, I think among us, there looks like a very um, strong positive towards, yes, definitely want to use it. I'll definitely use it. It's fun. And uh, we always, we should look at the, the, uh, the population as a whole and say, you know, and ask the, the, the people in the street, are you going to, uh, would you use a wallet? Once you explain it to them, you say, would you use it? If they say yes, and we, we've got here in this very uh, rough straw poll here, that we've got 60% of the people are saying, yes, we want to use it, we'll be using it in five years. If okay. not, where The end is? result might be very different across different countries. I yeah. Think. That's what will happen. Some countries will find a good concept and they will be successful and it will have a large volume of transactions. Some countries will be close to zero. Uh, I, I would still sort of bet my money on average that, that the, the, the sort of government issued wallets are not likely to be very user friendly. They are not likely to address many of the use cases that people use on a daily basis. Uh, they are not likely to develop as fast as, as the sort of uh, customer needs or user needs develop. So that would sort of tell to me that there's a lot of room for private sector identity and payments wallets coming to the market and taking the transaction volume uh, by far, uh, whereas the sort of uh, EU identity wallets are more like anchor identity wallets for onboarding uh maybe account recovery type of use cases yeah uh but which would be which would be kind of sad you know, if, if we think about that then the the private sector wallets to not have this presumption of being interoperable between the member states being currently the relying party authentication having some kind of a trusted list where you can get the trust source uh, as a relying party and that would be really, really hard for anyone to perform those actions if we have like tens of different wallets out there, if you don't have a central control of what is trustworthy and what is not. So so it, I, I see your point that it might happen, but it will be a, a very, very hard thing to pull off and, and we don't gain from the regulation anything uh, almost uh, if, if we go this direction, but it might be, uh, as you said, the, the future. Also wanted to point out, uh, uh, John, the uh, uh, semantics of the question. You didn't ask if we really want to have that wallet. It was a question, do we envision that we will use it? <laughs> Unfortunately or fortunately? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, would we? <laughs> yes, but my hands, fingers crossed, as they say. But it's, 
um, what you say is right, but it depends on the use. You know, if I can envisage extending what you're saying, if I want to do something interoperable across border, I'll use a government wallet. Uh, if I if I'm talking between in an organizational world, they may well have different wallets for different interest groups. So uh, a particular um, trade association for its members may want to issue its own wallet because it may want to have particular uh, terms and conditions and uh, um, uh, other conditions of working that may be particular to that industry. So there is an advantage of doing it that way. Whether or not it will be open, an open environment or not is something else. Uh, for an open wallet that you can use anywhere with anybody, then it really has, uh, it should be um, a government backed or a member state backed wallet with the uh, EID. But once you're moving out of that into a more um, tight domain, uh, then maybe you might want to use other things if the contractual uh, terms and conditions are correct. It's an interesting point, and that goes back over onto organizational wallets, because companies that are working uh, within a group may choose to have their own wallet type if they're um, with particular conditions, or if they're looking certain companies if are working with the public it's probably they'll probably want to use the uh, um, um, wallet the government wallet of the european identity wallet that we're talking about now so i think the range of what there might be a range of wallets rather than one type of wallet only per country that may be the one type of wallet will be um, one type of wallet at least as the regulation says, uh, per member state, but there could be more. And we'll have to wait and see how that progresses. If there's a business case to have more than one wallet per member state as well, let's not forget it that it's, there's got to be a business case. Um, OK, so and I, I think the wallet issue business case is, is part of the sort of crux here. Uh, yeah. So applies to government wallets also, government issued wallets especially. Uh, if they don't have a business case, there's not much ability to budget sort of continuously development money to improve it, to make it more secure, to add use cases into it. On the private sector side, uh, I think the wallet issuer business case, uh, sort of putting it sort of very, very sort of uh, on a high level and, and very straight, in the end, it's, it's the relying parties, the merchants that will pay. Uh, it's not the users that will pay. Uh, and the merchants will pay essentially for, for onboarding of new customers, and they will pay for the checkout payment functionality of the wallet. And that's why I think that these sort of private sector wallets typically will be sort of identity and payment wallets combined, and they will build ecosystems in which they can utilize or monetize the, the, the user data with the user consent, of course. Yeah. So I'll jump in on that one because it's you're pointing at a very very important uh, issue there, and that is uh, the wallet is what the user has and the user sees, but a whole ecosystem is planned and uh, mandated and going to be built behind it from uh, every country appointing uh, what's called authentic sources, which are the official source of truth for certain information. To attribute at the station providers to directory rate directories showing where should I go to go to get certain piece of information, to signing to what not, and um, all those components are played off by actors that need a own business model. Not only the wallet provider, but all of them. And uh, a business model is either uh, commercial, you get paid for your services and you make a living from them, or it's government funded, in which case there needs to be a budget. This needs to be clear. And there's also um, uh, a question again, will that infrastructure that's going 
that's going to be built for the European, the national wallets, to call it that way, will that infrastructure be available also to other wallet providers? And yes, it might be. There's nothing in ADOS that says that attribute attestations can only be issued to a European wallet. They can be issued to other wallets as well. So uh, there is there is some, some option there. Carl, I think I interrupted you. <laughs> Uh, my quick comment was that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that very brief uh, could be a like, long one, but uh, first of all, the ecosystem doesn't kind of seem to concern the uh, legislatures. Uh, legislators uh, at the moment did a um, wishful write down of uh, the wishes, and nobody's worried about how it will be funded because the taxpayers probably will fund it. But the other thing is that Jan, I totally agree with the fact that there could be a private sector wallets and, and those could be very, very successful. The question is, is there any need for EA-2.0 for that? And there isn't. Mm. Like, this thing could be pulled off by the uh, private sector without any push from the government and, and any central management of, uh, of development uh, on the technical level. I would say that there we have over-engineered the legislation and uh, well, st strengthened the control over the market and actually taken away some of the potential uh, experiments uh, that otherwise could have turned up to be successful also in, in EU. So, I, I, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I, 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 think brief, word, yeah. I think the key word in your uh, uh, comments there was could as opposed to would be produced. I think uh, at the very least, the EI DAS processes kick kick this into action. Whether companies could have done it by themselves, sure. Would they have done it by themselves? Not sure. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just talk about companies a little bit and company wallets and things. If I was a company and I had uh, an EID that I produced for my employees, for example, what should I do? Should I just continue doing that? Or should I put it in as a um, credential into uh, the government wallet or another wallet and use it? Um, what's going to be the impact on uh, company IDs for specifically for my employees or for um, um, my customers if I want to provide identification? Uh, what's the views of that from the panel? Um, We'll start, uh... You have to, you have to register as a relying party for the European identity wallet, and then if you want to issue your company employee a, a token there, an attribute, then you have to also somewhere get the attribute attestation service provider issuing you attestation to this mm -hmm. wallet, and you are free to go. Yeah, do yes, but do you think that's going to be a uh, replace what I'm doing within my organisation? I've got. 10,000 users, uh, 10,000 uh, employees. Am I going to just let those run, go away and uh, uh, use? I, I, I don't world? see you doing that for any good reason. <laughs> well, one so, of so, the, so, oh. yeah, you, you don't think so. It might, the, yeah, the good point is, is there a reason to do it? Is there I, a I, reason to use the wallets? I, I think there is a, there's a whole amount of, of large consumer B2C and even some B2B companies out there that essentially they, they already run very large customer loyalty programs with millions of users, potentially cross borders. Uh, and, and I think this kind of company identities and company wallets with identities and payment means in them, the payment means can be token as credit cards, they can be account to account authorizations, they can equally well in the future, especially be sort of uh, loyalty program specific currencies, uh, uh, loyalty points, but in, in a more advanced form in, in a digital currency format. Uh, I think those those will be uh, quite powerful ecosystems and some of these companies will be successful in launching them and they will integrate third-party merchants into their ecosystems. So the decision that many companies will face is, do we try to become a sort of 
uh, wallet issuer slash ecosystem provider ourselves with our brand or should we join somebody else's? Uh, I think that is a key sort of strategic decision. And, and the, the bar, of course, to be successful in, in, as a wallet issuer uh, in the private sector will be increasing quite rapidly uh, as the existing ecosystems grow bigger, have more functionality, more and more third party use cases incorporated into them. Yeah. Uh, in those same tools can be, of course, used for employees and, 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 and yeah. the same logic applies in my mind into B2B contexts also. Yeah, the interesting thing is, if you look at the loyalty programs from organizations with the public, what's the real goal is to incorporate, uh, to build yourself more and more part of the daily life of your customer and to envelop their life more. So. Uh, if you're a supermarket, everything is revolving around the supermarket, it ties loyalty even more if you've got feelers into every part of your customer's life. In, in short, it's customer data. Yeah, yeah. It's customer data, it's loyalty, it's uh, people immediately think, I need something, oh, I've, and your brand pops up in the uh, wallet before you start. We're not even talking about the branding yet that you could have on a wallet. That in itself is uh, something I don't think anybody's talked about that. In, in, but but uh, there's also an aspect of, of cost savings and, and yeah. fraud reduction. So within a, a wallet ecosystem, you onboard users once and onboarding new users is always a costly, costly action to take. Uh, it can be much cheaper if you use an existing EID, uh, if you use an, an EU government issued identity wallet, uh, but still and the other part, of course, is that if you manage the onboarding and the sort of uh, user transactions within the ecosystem, uh, and you have also KYB and onboarded all the merchants in the ecosystem, you can manage fraud more effectively, more effectively than in a sort of open payments environment. Yeah. It's I think um, if I can do a bit on, on, on some some aspects there. I think um, they made one thing right in the specifications for the EU wallet, and that is you have a mandatory type one uh, wallet, which is all the protocols and all the basic identity stuff and attribute attestation stuff. Then you got a type two, where essentially you can put any application on a national level, on a loyalty card, uh, brand, uh, your golf club membership, anything could go in there. Uh, and uh, I think that's good because it leaves flexibility to applications that are not government, not anything like that. So, um, it's it's not that those parts are not going to be interoperable cross border, of course, but it's 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 going to be there. So that, I think that's good. But uh, I think from a reliant part of view, and um, to us in Signica, who is a provider uh, of identity services to businesses. Uh, I think the important message we need to get across is that it, you should prepare for the wallet because it will be there and many of you will even be mandated to accept it. Okay, it's by 2027, but think ahead. But it's not going to be the only one. You can't rely on, uh, for many, many years at least, uh, if it's a success, maybe a later, but uh, you can't rely on the wallet being the only idea around. You need to cater for uh, all the other uh, ways of joining your service, accessing your service that are there. So um, what we will do in the first run, for example, at Syndicate is we will integrate support for the Euro European wallets in parallel with all the other EIDs we support in our identity hub. So as a relying party, if you use our identity services, you'll get the uh, wallet uh, in parallel and through the same interface as uh, the other EIDs. And then we need to expand on it later because the wallet has more capabilities than most DRAs in the market today. And that's, um, that's good. And that's also something you as a relying party can capitalize on later when the wallet has um, a deployment. You can do it using the wallet and it's easier. You can do it using another EID and it's a little bit more cumbersome because you don't go get all these uh, at attribute at the stations and verified attributes. But uh, it's it's evolving. Please don't. It's not a paradigm shift. Even if it could be a paradigm shift and a society game changer, 
it's not that change is not going to happen overnight. But let's prepare for um, all the eventualities. I think John, uh, you'll, uh, that's exactly right. One of what will make a success it's the attestations, because otherwise you can just use an EID for identity identification. The attestations are the game are the game changer for the citizen. How on earth we explain without lots of education the difference between a qualified uh, uh, attestation and something that isn't qualified, explain that to the citizen in the street is another whole issue. It's, uh, and we're back to education and everything around that. But we're also down to the back to the fact that it's, um, it's a value that was going to be to the citizen or to the organization. That's going to be the key thing on this. Uh, I would love to talk about this forever and a day, and I don't. I always get the feeling sometimes, like in this particular case, that we're almost at a point where we just scratched the surface. Uh, but unfortunately, we're at. Uh, we've got so many questions. I'd like to try and address some of the questions now, if I may, and. Um, just to say also that we're, what I know for a fact that we won't be able to answer all the questions in the next 10 minutes or so. So we'll try to, but I, we will be able, what we'll try and do is to answer all of the questions individually after the, the, um, after the webinar uh, over the coming days, um, and then we'll, obviously send those back but it's uh, at this point we'll just try and uh, dig into them a little bit and the first one is uh, um i can see there are more corporate wallet use cases than for private persons why not connecting verifiable leis uh legal entity identifiers and iso 5009 uh, official organizational roles into the eu corporate wallets wallets for standard description of private persons representing legal entities. Now, um, I, we, we all think and we've thought about this. So I'll go from uh, Caleb and uh, work across Caleb. Well, this is just one of the great examples of what kind of fun, uh, interesting ideas people have, what kind of things in to put into this wallet at the moment i think that nothing uh, prohibits that to be the case at the end but uh, yeah the verified legal uh, uh, identities first of all well they do cost you money most of the small companies don't get one uh, so this is one reason why why not to have them there uh, but from the other point yeah if we as a uh, ecosystem one day find that this is necessary it can be done but this needs to be then mandated uh, but not to go too far it's just one of the fun ideas what to put in the wallet it isn't mandated like that anywhere and probably as a thing will not happen as well thank you Jana uh, I, I would kind of leave it at what Kalev said I very much agree on that and there's a lot of interesting other questions so we can move forward into those okay um let's uh, i'm just scrolling down them and uh, the relationship between uh, organization uh, between wallets the, the wallets and uh the financial institutions uh of course because they started off didn't they as uh um the the wallets in everybody's mind is a wallet financial wallet so um, what's the the question here uh, is what is the um, what does the regulation say with regards to financial institutions in particular? I, if I may go here first, I yeah. think it depends very much which regulation you look at, uh, and it's it's uh, in my mind still a, a open question for me. Will the EU identity wallets support? payments use cases will they support eventual digital euro for example uh, 
PSD2 SCA, of course, being the sort of short term question. Uh, and I think many people on the sort of identity side hope that they will. Uh, on the payment side, I think it's very much an open question still. But it may be other panelists have other thoughts on this. Well, first of all, on the electronic services, the obligation for the financial sector will be to accept the wallet as the identification tool, wherever the uh, regulations of the member state or EU state that you have to have a strong customer authentication in place. And this is the case for the financial sector. They have to use it. So the obligation to use it will be there. Uh, yes, it will surely support uh, strong customer authentication uh, as required by uh, the payment services directives. Uh, and it will support um, authentication to financial services. It should, shall also be possible to use it for onboarding to financial services which is where sharing of information, sharing of verified information can, of course, come into play. Um, it's the link to the EU digital finance strategy and uh, the, call it unification of financial markets in Europe. I think it can be an important component, but uh, I can't give you all the details on why I think that. It's just that uh, it has the capabilities that, um, could be really useful to uh, to get cross border finance uh, better in place in Europe. Yeah. And I, be, I think that was one of the disappointments with EIDAS 1.0 is that the, the sort of financial regulation, identity regulation remained separate. Yeah. Hopefully they are joined together this time. Yeah, one of the interesting use cases, of course, is KYC and uh, know your customer and anti money laundering uh, credentials. If you for SMEs in particular, it'd be a lot easier if they had in their wallet in their organizational wallets uh, KYC and AML credentials for them to go onto platforms that actually uh, require um, that uh, onboarding that as part of their onboarding. If you've got it already, because that's one of the big issues I should imagine for SMEs is the cost of getting the KYC and AML credentials in place before they um, um, before they can act on a platform that requires that. Um, I'm, I'm, I think that's going to be one of the real uh, winners for the SMEs, at least, uh, that they'll be able to um, play with the uh, on a par with the big boys with regards to um, uh, know your customer and KYC because you'll have the credentials there already and you can just present them rather than having to go back to the bank and going through that so there's a big saving in itself for a, a, an sme and could probably save them i don't know a significant amount of money um, um the i've got a question here um we should not forget about the main driver behind the initiative, which is to ensure the functioning, not really a question, to ensure the functioning of the digital internal market, in short, enabling cross-border use of EIDs and credentials. I think that's a very important point as well. And uh, cross-border is, is always interesting. And there's been a measure, I think there's been a measured, measurable, in increase in cross-border activity um but is is it going to be is it a big is it going to make a big incremental difference because that's the goal of course would be really nice to just to not uh, uh worry about borders uh with any transactions that you do but i suspect there'll be other factors that come in which cause restrictions local uh, legislation for example should we use that as the closing sort of thought to linger in, in participants' yeah. minds? I think so. I think uh, we should we should be going back on that. And that's. I'd like to thank everybody. And uh, if I can pass it to you, Jana, to finish to close the meeting. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much for all the participants. Uh, it has been, like said, a, a scratch on the surface. This is a, a highly interesting topic what will happen to existing EIDs when the EU wallets come to market and what kind of role will they play? 
Uh, I think uh, our panel with Kale, uh, John, and the other Jon from Signicat, uh, super discussion, different aspects being represented, uh, very much sort of uh, existing players in the market and, and looking forward to the future uh, with bright eyes and, and, and keen minds. Uh, like I said, we will come back to the questions on, an, on a response email later. We will also make a recording available. Uh, if you have additional questions or want to discuss these topics, please don't hesitate to be in touch with any of us uh, and let us our, our journeys towards sort of safer digital future continue together going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.